This evening, though, I want to talk about Du Bois and his legacy and draw from a recent book. This is Du Bois here, sorry. The recent book is a very important book uh, by a fellow called a friend called Alden uh, Morris. We were together in, the, in around June in South Africa. We spoke at the University of Johannesburg. And uh, he was you know, a very important scholar in that what he tried to do is to give Du Bois what is due him in the sense that Du Bois has been denied his rightful place in American intellectual thought. I will talk a little bit about that. But the fact of the matter is that sociology in this country uh, was begun by the Atlanta School. Du Bois, when he was at Fisk in 1895, together with people like Charles Johnson and others are the ones who really are in fa fact the fathers of, Af uh, of um, American sociology. The Chicago School would come much later on. But that's not the trust of my debate. But this is the point that uh, Alden wants to make. Uh, he claims, and I concur, that Du Bois is truly the father of American sociology. And this is not to be wondered at. Even before Morris's claim, Norman Clean, in his introduction to the 1969 edition of Du Bois's The Suppression of the African Slave Trade in the United States, 1838, 1870, observed, and I quote, that the political and cultural voice, yeah, that, the, uh, that the political and cultural voice of the wide range of his people's struggle and his attainments ranks him among the great men of our time. This is as early as 1969, uh, in terms of the introduction to the second edition that came out in 1969. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. I suspect no good teacher takes anything for granted. Many teachers here know that you don't take anything at all for granted. Uh, you always presume some degree of uh, non-knowledge. So I believe I should fill in a few biographical notes on Du Bois before I launch into my talk. Perhaps we can start with the fact that Du Bois was one of the most distinguished American scholars of the 20th century. We have to divest ourselves of the view that he's an Afro-American scholar or he's a black scholar. He's simply one of the most important scholars of the 20th century. He was born on February 23rd, 1868, hence our celebration of 150 years of his birth. He lived a long life. Uh, in Great Barrington, he was born about, I suspect, 50 or 60 miles from here, right? Where he received his high school education before going on to study at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And he was quite drawn by the people there when you talk about, and the life he saw around him, because he was a, a guy from the Northeast and was thrust into the South. Uh, it must have been quite an experience for him to go into the Black Belt. And of course, you're talking about less than a, de less than a generation after slavery ended. So it must have been quite an experience for him. He then went on to Harvard, where, of course, he received his PhD. Uh, but also went on to the University of Berlin in Germany, where he, uh, where he did a lot of work with some of the more important thinkers there. In fact, I think there's very little of statistics uh, and question of sociological uh, uh, um, approaches to his work. One year after he left Harvard, his dissertation, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade, to the United States, a landmark work in the field of history, was really was published uh, by uh, in the, the Harvard Historical Studies. In this book, we see the first example of Du Bois's use of Du Bois using his scholarship to grapple with the truth about his people, and as he noted uh, in his book. He says, it behooves the United States, therefore, in the interests both of scientific truth and future social reform, carefully, he says, 
to study such chapters of her history as that of the suppression of the slave trade. The most obvious question which this study suggests, quote, is how far in a state can a moral wrong safely be compromised? Of course, he's, I think, latching on. I think he's latching on. Just one second. Yeah, I think he's latching on. I think he's latching on the whole notion of what we see in our declaration about all people, all men and women being created equal. But he sees, at this early point, he sees the question merely in moral terms. But he recognized that in writing his book and doing and putting such a, placing such an emphasis on the moral aspect of his work that he was letting go of the economic aspect of the phenomenon. As you well know, um, he wasn't a Marxist yet, certainly, but certainly he recognized later on when in 1954 he did an apologia to uh, a, a new edition of the work. He uh, clarified, he clarified the emphasis, he clarified the emphasis uh, that he placed on the moral rather than the economic dimensions of his analysis. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, and of course what he said is that at Harvard, he learned nothing about Marx and Sigmund Freud. Of course, Freud would have been new because Freud was the one, as you well know, that, of course, the whole continent of the unconscious was his forte. And certainly Marx was a bad boy because he wasn't supposed to deal with Marx. Of course, one would have thought that he's going to Germany. He would have, of course, immediately delved into Marx and Marx's interpretation and understanding of uh, the role of economics in terms of the making of human societies. But he says that um, after acknowledging that he'd heard little about Har uh, 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 Marx at uh, Harvard, he says, and I quote, he says, in Germany, I heard much more of Marxism, but in rebuttal of his theories rather than explanation. We were more concerned about rebutting the theses and theories of Marx, even in Germany, than rather than trying to come to grips with its uh, implications for social development. I got the idea that his teaching already had been superseded and consequently gave little time to first-hand study of his work. This was import important in my interpretation of the history of slavery and the slave trade, for if the influence of economic motives on the actions of mankind ever had clearer illustration, it was in the modern history of the African race, and particularly in America. No real conception of this appears in my book. And that's important, because at that time, of course, I say he's grappling more with the moral, the moral, sort of moral suasion, what's wrong about keeping these black folks enslaved and going to Africa and getting them. Uh, but he, later on, he says, no real conception of this appears in my book. There are some approaches, some allusions, but no complete realization of the application of the philosophy of Karl Marx to my subject. That concept came much later when I began intensive study on the facts of society culminating in Black Reconstruction of 1835, which in fact becomes his major work. And major, well, of course, he's got a lot of major works, I mean, for left maker and so on. But in terms of his interpretation of our uh, history and the role that black folks played in the making of the modern world, and the role that black labor played, and I will sure demonstrate, I think, is the same point that C.L.R. James makes, which I'll come to that in a minute, in Black Jacobins, and the same point Eric Williams makes in capitalism slavery in terms of the importance of slavery and the slave trade in terms of the construction of the Industrial Revolution. Now, you always got some friends. I got a friend, very famous friend of Wellesley, uh, uh, what's his name? I forget his name. Uh, Craig Murphy. And he always picks me up on that. And uh, they could have had the Industrial Revolution without the slave trade. We didn't need your money. Well, I'm not too sure that's true. But certainly, that is the point that really where these three major scholars are going. <laughs> 
Suffice it to say, though, that one can begin to examine Du Bois's work by attempting to answer the major question that he poses, quote, how far in a state can a moral wrong be safely compromised? Of course, we'll see the old question of slavery and the slave trade as a moral wrong. How much could it compromise the social development of the society? You may even go a little further and say, how could be the annihilation of the Indians by uh, 50, 45 or 54? Put up his big picture there uh, in terms of the annihilation of the Indians. How far does that have to structure into our understanding of ourselves as a nation? Is there any sense of historic guilt there, or should we consider that as part of our, 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 our heritage? From 1984 to 1896, Du Bois taught Greek, Latin, German, and English at Wilberforce University in Ohio. In 1896, he married Nina Gomer of Iowa. Herbert Apfecker, his biographer, notes that Du Bois was not, quote unquote, primarily particularly happy in teaching those subjects. He wanted to teach sociology, a discipline for which he was trained. In May 1966, 1896, however, just at the time when the suppression of the African slave trade, because it's quite an honor to have Harvard Historical Studies publish the suppression of, uh, uh, of the African slave trade. And while that book was in, uh, in press, and there was preparation to come out and so on, the University of Pennsylvania gave him an opportunity, quote unquote, to undertake a sociological study focusing upon the black people of Philadelphia with a salary of 900 bucks a year. And needless to say, Du Bois accepted it eagerly. And the, Wil the Wilberforce authorities did nothing to discourage him or stop him. It's always very interesting when you got somebody, you don't know how great he is until he or she leaves you. In fact, I was making the story, telling the story to Gigi We've got one of the most, Cillian Marwell at Bursley had one of the most important theorist artists. I don't know if anybody knows the name Adrian Piper. Mm. Know the name Adrian Piper? Well, she's one of the most important uh, artists in this country. Well, she doesn't live here anymore. But she's also a philosopher. Her major work is on Kant. And she came to Wellesley, and my God, we let her go. <laughs> Same thing is true with Alice Walker, right? We let her go too. But today, uh, Adrian Piper has a great retrospective at MoMA. And I was saying again to Gigi, I had a discussion yesterday from the New York Times Magazine, they're going to do a big story now next week or next month, and I want to find out about her and so on and so forth. So sometimes we let these people get away. They also let, uh, uh, they also let uh, uh, Du Bois get away. Also, I think Harvard allowed Du Bois papers to get away. <laughs> that in point of fact, Harvard had the first digs did not want it. Wow. And that's where they bound up here at Amherst. <laughs> In fact, she even taught here. I mean, uh, Shirley Graham Du Bois. But Harvard didn't think, you know, mm, yeah, black guy, who was he? Even though he was one of our graduates. So sometimes the best get away. And so Du Bois got away from Wilberforce. And of course, from there, went on to make a name for himself. Now, it was interesting that he chose to do, uh, to ask him to study in uh, Philadelphia. It was an important study because that's one of the first major texts we have in scientific socialism. By that I mean there were theorists before. The European guys who came and some went to the new school and all that stuff, and even Chicago were really theoretical sociologists. Du Bois was practical and empirical. As you well know, that uh, in terms of America's philosophical strain is really <laughs> pragmatism. William James and those guys, which is really a kind of bastard form of empiricism of John Locke and others. America's philosophical position is, of course, pragmatism. You got the biggest bill, let's break the damn thing down and get something new. Or the United Nations does, does not work because it doesn't have a police force. Uh, but it's a pragmatic strain, John Oliver Wendell Holmes and those. A very good book called The Metaphysical Light, the, Metaphys the Metaphysical Club, 
uh, really examines that uh, that uh, that uh, pragmatic position not only in literature but also in things like psychology and so on. You should get a book on that. At any rate, so of course here is Du Bois really getting the chance to do an empirical study, and that's the distinction I want to make in terms of the, its beginning as scientific sociology in terms of facts and numbers, etc. It's not simply about theory. It's about going out there and doing the field work, and of course, that is what Du Bois did. At the time that he did his study, Philadelphia had the largest African-American population, perhaps the most influential black community in the country. This study was a tremendous undertaking. Listen to this. Du Bois working eight hours a day, questioned over 10,000 black Philadelphians to produce the first scientific sociological document in the country. Went from house to house to really get that document done. Four years after undertaking his task, in an autobiographical, in an autobiographical biographical essay in Richard uh, Rayford Lohman's What the Negro Wants, du Bois discusses why he undertook this study. And he says, he says, Philadelphia then, and still, one of the worst governed in America's badly governed cities. Of course, remember, this is 1900, so it may have changed. I don't know. I don't know. Where was this guy arrested at Starbucks? Yeah, Philadelphia. Hello, sorry. I, 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 I'm not too sure. I don't know these things. You know, I, uh, Philadelphia then is still one of the worst governing of America's badly governed cities was having one of its periodic spasms of reform. A thoroughly, a thoroughly study of causes was called for. None but what had the study cause was evident to most white Philadelphians. The corrupt semi-criminal vote of the Negro Seventh Ward. Everyone agreed that there here lay the cancer but would it not be well to elucidate the known causes by a scientific investigation with the imprimatur of the University of Pennsylvania? So what they did really gave him lease and a sort of legitimacy to do a study. 10,000 homes, check it out. Eight hours a day, and I have my notes here. If I told you what Du Bois' schedule was each day, you would cry and cringe. Du Bois truly believed then, as he did throughout his long life, as he began throughout his long life, that one can argue uh, that to remove the ignorance from behind the veil, the ignorance of white people, from behind the veil, a metaphor used a whole lot of times, that one had to do that kind of work. In 1903, after doing that very important study, the Philadelphia Negro, which comes out, I think, about 1898, one of the major studies, first study on American sociology, Du Bois writes, The Souls of Black Folk a collection of essays published previously, of course there were a collection of essays, published essays before, in which he speaks about the peculiarity of the African-American condition, the obstacles that prevented black people from realizing the benefit of emancipation, his difference with Booker T. Washington, what he called double consciousness, that was experienced by black people in America. As you know, at that time, the gatekeeper of, uh, of African Americans was, of course, Booker T. Washington. Uh, this, his autobiography talks about a famous Atlanta exposition speech. And he says, all things, we could be separate, etc., like the fingers of a hand, uh, but gave the go-ahead to have Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 that talk about the fact that separate could be equal, which was not overthrown until you had a 1954 decision, Board of Education 
saying that separate, in fact, was not equal. But of course, it starts with Du Bois and of course with our Booker T, who had his positions, and I shan't go into that. I think the third chapter, the third, the, the third essay uh, of Booker T and others is where she talks about their conditions and so on. And where, of course, Booker T was, oh well, he preferred we could do industrial education and let white folks think for us. And why you want to learn Latin, that's not important. And so on. So Du Bois, think of this gentleman from the Northeast with all your or our pretensions. And he goes to the South and finds somebody who doesn't want to do that. At any rate, he, uh, he talks about that in his book. And of course, his very prescient notion of the double consciousness, the sense that black folks in this country feel a sense of what he says, a sense of two-ness. You're Americans at one level, but then you're not accepted as Americans, and so therefore that is their conflict at a level of one's consciousness. One's never, even though this is our home, one never feels at home, and that's what he talks about there. It's become a great important metaphor in speaking about the condition of black people. By now, of course, his most famous pronouncement in that book is the fact when he argued that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, 1903. And of course, we have all lived to see that the major problem of the 20th century indeed has been the uprising of people of color, uh, whatever part of the world you want to go to, South Africa, uh, Indonesia, Niger wherever you want to go, Nigeria, black power coming in the middle of the century, that in fact the problem of color in the 20th century, and of course there are hangovers in the 21st century, has still remained a problem, maybe even of the 21st century. But he was very prophetic when he talked about the fact that the problem of the 20th century was in fact the problem of the color line. And of course that was one of the major claims that was made in uh, the souls of black folk. Of course, he ends this wonderful rendition of his people's feelings with something called the sorrow songs, or the Negro folk songs, or what he calls the rhythmic cry of the slaves, of which he says, quote, the cries of the slaves, of course, the sorrow songs, the spiritual, nobody knows, the trouble I've seen, etc. He says those spirit spirituals, or those sorrow songs, as he called it, really, really spoke to and sp came from the souls of black folk. You want to hear their pain. Listen to Paul Robeson. I mean, those folks who I know, Paul Robeson here. No, I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> but he says that the sorrow song stands today not simply as the sole American music, but as the most beautiful expression of human experience born this side of the seas. It has been neglected. It has been and is half despised. And above all, it has been persistently mistaken and misunderstood. But notwithstanding, it still remains as the singular spiritual heritage of the nation and the greatest gift of the Negro people to US, the United States of America. I think most of us agree that in fact the spirituals, blues, jazz, etc., are really the peculiar contribution of African Americans, certainly in the musical world, to American music. People would argue there's no authentic American music, no authentic American expression than the, the blues and the spirituals, of course, as it reflects a people's pain and speaks to the mighty contradiction of the society. As you well know, there's always that contradiction throughout Afro American intellectual thought between what we says in the, you know, we create, uh, all men are created equal, we hold these truths to be self-evident and all that kind of nice good stuff. And uh, then of course the actual con condition, and we still see it here, as we said in Starbucks. So even now, that, that contradiction keeps playing itself out, and I think it will probably take a while before it's worked through, but Du Bois understood that. But Du Bois, was not content to offer effusive praises of the emotionally filled cries of the slave. He also perceived the peculiar hope 
that emerge from their suffering. And what he says, that was the betrothal is really through all the sorrow of the sorrow songs, that is, through all the lamentations, etc. And remember, he goes to the black belt, eh? that's the heart of African American life, Alabama, and so on. He says, through all the sorrow of the sorrow songs, there breeds a hope a faith in the ultimate justice of things. The minor cadences of despair change often to triumph and calm confidence. Sometimes it is fate in life, sometimes a fate in death, sometimes assurance of the boundless justice in some fair world beyond. But whichever it is, the meaning is always clear that sometime, somewhere, men will judge men by the, their souls, souls of black folk, and not by their skins. That sounds very much like MLK, doesn't it? Is such a hope justified? Do sorrow songs sing true? Part of the thing you'll find out is that those central themes starts, you go back to even Frederick Douglass. You go back to uh, Du Bois, right up to MLK, that whole notion of seeking a place and the judging people by the quality of the, you know, the content of the character, it means the same thing. But here, of course, is Du Bois at the forefront making that claim. He says, but whatever it is, of course, and he knew that black folks clung very much to the Bible. I mean, some of the most heartfelt, ever been to a black service at a, a black AME church? And folks get happy. Jesus. Uh, and you begin to wonder what's going on. Better than Jonathan Edwards, you know. I know you've done Jonathan Edwards, <laughs> Angels of Hand or something, Angry God and all that stuff. No, that's not the real thing. The real thing is the Amy Church. And, uh, but he says that, that those songs, Strangers in the Hands of an Angry God, American Revival. But I understand there's a lot of black people in that, that, that in, around following Jonathan Edwards, so it's all right. But interestingly enough, Du Bois used the essay form, and this is what I was talking about, that Du Bois really, as Frederick Douglass, as James Baldwin, as Tanashi Coates, and so on, that one of the primary form that they all used was the essay form to structure what is generally accepted as his most profound meditation on the African-American condition. The essay as a form uh, is the choice means. Uh, it is not coincidental that African Americans have used this form to express their most intimate thoughts and most urgent messages. Frederick Douglass, Du Bois' immediate predecessor, also used the essay to express his most profound thoughts. And that's, I guess, the quote that I just talked about. But at any rate, uh, James Baldwin was also adept. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, so James Baldwin was also adept at using the essay as a means to express his anger at the white world. Remember, I, I teach as a literary theorist, so we just got to talk about the content. We got to talk about the form, right? Any, any, any literary people here? The form, the choice of form is the essay. Of course, because it's much more direct. It's very emotive and so on. But James Baldwin was also adept at using the essay as a means to express his anger at the white world. Tinashe Coates did a similar thing in his best-selling Between the World and Me. Few will remember that Du Bois began his souls of black folk on a similar note. Anybody know Tanisha's Code book? What's the title of it? What's the title of Tanisha's Code book? Between the World and Me. A million dollar seller. But for like Du Bois did that before, you know? This is how Du Bois begins the soul of black folk. Du Bois says, between me and the world, <laughs> there's an ever an asked question. How does it feel to be a problem? Simple essay. Between 
me and the world, well, he says, between the world and me, but between me and the world, there's an ever unasked question. How does it feel to be a problem? And in fact, this is why Henry Louis Gates is so correct when he says, quote unquote, Du Bois was, in the end, an essayist. An essayist of the first order one of the masters of that protean form that so attracted Du Bois only through ante ante an antecedent, Frederick Douglass, as well as Du Bois' heir in the history of the form, James Baldwin. And so it's very important to see, even now you know him as a sociologist, you know him as uh, doing other kinds of things, but even in terms of the literary form, as an essayist, of course, you know when he'd run crisis, of course, he was the guy to who a lot of the, uh, the, the Harlem Renaissance writers, uh, women writers too, got their start. So he's not purely, he's really that kind of Renaissance man who is also about the literary and the use of art. Of course, he made it clear, though, he made it clear, though, that uh, all art is propaganda. <laughs> so how we use it is interesting, but of course... He makes it clear that, of course, and I think Skip is quite correct when he says that um, when he says that Du Bois is an essay. So even the level of the literary dimension of our work, that Du Bois plays a very important part there in terms of even the writing. However. Not content with philosophizing about the problem because he said, how does it feel? That's Du Bois' thing. I mean, people talk and say all kinds of nice language, meet them all over the place, and we'll always, always end with the question, how does it feel to be a problem? But not content simply with philosophizing about the, pro the problem, Du Bois also gave his time and energy to organizing black people in their struggle for justice and freedom. So he was not just simply a theorist. We said he went out and did his field work in Philadelphia Negro. But in terms of even coming to terms with the problems that confronted black folks in the practical sense, he was also there. You would probably remember that between 1900 and about 1920, you had the most lynchings in this country. And the whole formation of the Niagara movement and so on was in fact to combat that lynching. So again, he's willing not to put his, his, his words, or his, put his hands or his action where his words and his mouth were. On July 10th, 1905, Du Bois, William Monroe Trotter, and, 20, and 20 and others who opposed Booker e. Washington's philosophy met at Niagara Falls in the Erie Beach Hotel in Ontario, Canada to reinvent American politics or African American politics as it were. This led to the formation of the Niagara Movement and subsequently to NAACP in New York in 1909, signaling a continuation of Du Bois' struggle against racism in this country. The big point I want to make here, and I think it may be obvious, he was not just simply an Ivy League armchair intellectual making pronouncements. That apart from doing the field work as a sociologist, he also put his rub his sleeves up. In fact, he also ran for, for, for this for the Senate, I think, as a U.S. communist. Anybody knows the U.S. Communist Party, right? You've got to be old enough to remember that. Anybody remembers the U.S.? Young people don't. But there's a U.S. Communist Party, of which uh, Gus Hall was the president, and Henry Winston, black guy, was the secretary. And in the 70s, while I was in Ohio, I went to Chicago to hear the U.S. Communist Party. And those guys, of course, Henry Winston had gotten found his refuge in our Cuba, came back here blinded, but that's a whole other part of their history. <laughs> it's funny when you look back, the kinds of things you got involved in. I was even telling someone in terms of South Africa, we had a cell in Ohio, I told of Ohio, we had a cell in Ohio uh, supporting South Africa and ANC. I mean, at that time, of course, you know, Mandela was what? A terrorist. Mandela was a terrorist. <laughs> Couldn't come here. In fact, when I was in Ohio, a fellow called Alfred Nizo, who was the Secretary General of the NC, came to Ohio. At that time, we were all proud Marxists. And I took him up to Harvard. And interesting, all life is, got to Harvard, 
there were 70 people there to welcome him. In 1996 or so, Harvard gave the same terrorist, Mandela, an honorary doctorate outside the cycle. Harvard has given three honorary doctorates outside the cycle. Harvard gives his honorary doctorates at its commencement. The only three people who have received an uh, 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 honorary degree outside that cycle is whom? George Washington, Sir Winston Churchill, and Mandela. Good company. But the great part about that is how, how we treat the underdogs. That when you're under, nobody knows who you are. At any rate, Du Bois was willing to put his life on the line and put into practice. Theory without practice is blind. Practice without theory is equally as blind. There must be a dialectical relationship between the two because you go absolutely nowhere. At any rate, he was very instrumental in forming the NAACP out of the Ni Ni Niagara movement that began, had their first meeting uh, in 1905. In 1911, in 1911, in the aftermath of the founding of the NACP, Du Bois began to use a, the novel essay. Hello? Essay first. So is the black folks. Now the novel. Are you going to like this one? <laughs> in point of fact, he wrote about five novels. He was using any medium or any media to get his message out. That's why he's such a great Renaissance scholar, a Renaissance man. In 1911, in the aftermath of the founding of NAACP, Du Bois began to use the novels of form to attack the sins of racism and segregation. In the same year, 911, he published something called The Quest of the Silver Fleece. You ought to read his very first novel, The Quest of the Silver Fleece. Quote, in an attempt to provide a realistic portrayal, of the impact of cotton, racism, and peonage in the nation in the early 20th century. It's a big case, I think, Alabama versus someone else. And in point of fact, the peonage system was almost analogous to slavery. Formal slavery may have been ended, but the way in which they used black people in terms of tying them to their crops and the farms and the use of their, them and, and, uh, 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 prisoners to work on all these lands that Du Bois would argue was almost another form of what he would probably call semi-slavery. But certainly, peonage was very important. And when he wanted to talk about that, he used that novel form. In this work, that is, The Quest of the Silver Fleece, which I say is the first novel that Du Bois writes, one can argue that Du Bois got, was using the novel to channel the sociological views. This, is not bother, this, 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 this did not bother Du Bois because he felt that all art was propaganda anyway, which it really is, right? I'm not sure. Any, any aesthetic here? But he kind of believed that. He kind of believed that. And of course, yes, that's what art is doing. You're propagandizing a position. It may denote one thing or connote one thing, but to some degree you're promoting a, a point of view. But certainly he felt it could be used for his own purposes. Du Bois made two important moves in this work, that is, in the quest of the silver fleece. I won't talk about the others, just to talk about this one. Du Bois made two important moves in this work. He called the novel, quote unquote, an economic study of some merit. So it's, it's almost like he said in terms of what is, what, what is Norris's work? What is Norris's, work? Is Norris's uh, thing on wheat? Uh, I, I'll tell you the title in a few minutes. But he made two important work. He called the novel an economic study of some, some merit and links the new slavery with unjust contracts and laws, updating and amplifying his attack against Southern peonage. The novel devotes most of its attention to the issue of legal violence, particularly as regards to labor and property contracts. Interestingly enough, Du Bois seemed to understand that the ex-slave could be a revolutionary force in and of themselves, realizing that sometimes the revolutionary mass movement could take cultural and religious, and religious forms. That is a very important move. Anybody who studied uh, revolutionary theory and so on. Uh, you remember Lenin talking about the lumpen proletariat and, uh, and this guy, uh, Fernand, did a lot of work on it. 
But the fact of the matter is, if you were Marxist, they said that our uh, religion is what? The opiate of the people? Did Marx say that? And what he meant by that is a sort of outloaded thing about false consciousness. We know that doesn't exist. Consciousness is, right? There's no force about your consciousness. I mean, <laughs> it is. <laughs> but what you do uh, with your, your, your biddings is something quite different. At any rate, it was certainly a thesis of the Marxists or those who studied Marxism, that religion could never be a progressive force or used for progressive purposes because it does what? It speaks to what? How does it explain? What's the causal? How does, how does, what's the causal connection and phenomena according to the Marxists? He looks for material causation. You are what you are, not because of some first call, cause, call, gesture Christ or God, but you can explain your condition because of what? Your past history. That's historical materialism. In other words, that one can explain one's presence in the world not through a Godhead or a first cause, but through one's historical conditions. So when Kennedy shot, it's not because God wanted it. But when the earthquake, you messed up the earth now, you're going to have some problems. We had how many? How many Northeasters we had this time? This, this, last, this last month. We had about five Northeasters, right? I just say with the Great Barrier Reef, the corals are gone. So you can, there are natural, there are causation, not because Jesus Christ wants it or God says it must be so. But that's the difference between what he call an idealist position and a materialist position. But here's, here's Du Bois, as the Marxist, lifting up the importance of religion as a motive force for struggle, as you would see in the civil rights movement. The people who led the civil rights movements was not uh, some lumpen polita. It was king, it was the preachers. But again, here is the foresight of, of uh, here's the foresight of Du Bois again, his prescience, saying that religion, in terms of the black political struggle, is not a negative thing. It can be and is a positive phenomenon. That's a great big move in terms of philosophical theorizing between him and the Marxists. And he says here, foolish talk. All of this you say, of course, and is because no American now believes in his religion. In fact, its facts are mere symbolism, its revelations vague generalities, it's ethics a matter of carefully balanced. Again, he's talking about Christianity. It is how people see the religion. Not something they deeply believe in, but something as sort of strategic. He says, uh, in terms of the average, certainly at that time, Americans, is not something that's deeply believed in. But for the black folk, he says, to the, two, the four million black folk emancipated by the Civil War, God was real. They knew him. They had met him personally in many of a wild orgy of religious frenzy or in the black stillness of the night. To them, God was real. And why was God so real among black folk? Because in the worst of times, the only person they had could talk to was God and the belief that things would be better hereafter. You look at the American, Latin American um, um, uh, theologist who talk about the revolutionary nature of our religion, that for black folk, God was real. It wasn't some, some sort of symbol you have someplace else. And so for them, when they, they came together to fight against the tyrants who had kept them in, 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 in check, that for them, religion was real. If you're going to have a struggle against the conditions that held black folks down, religion had to be a part of it as, of course, our history shows in the civil rights movement, that black religion, black faith, is what carried black folks forward. In fact, it was led by a preacher man called MLK and other such preachers. But at least for him, his argument that God was real, and of course, to talk about uh, religion being the opiate of the people was a no-no to him. And he saw his, and to his best and to his, uh, his strength and foresight he was able to see that. In 1920, Du Bois published something called Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil. Again, another group of essays. 
that speaks to the liberation of black people. Now, wondrous piece called, quote unquote, the souls of white folk. 1903, souls of black folk. 1920, souls of white folk. Of course, what is going to relate the level of consciousness, right? We're not merely a bunch of atoms. Uh, I don't think we all are. And of course, there's the also, I mean, it's the St. Augustine who differentiated between body and soul, right? Was it St. Augustine who did that stuff? And then, of course, come along Freud and says, well, you're not just in body, you also have the unconscious, which we necessarily don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But those separation is understand that they, we are more than simply our material being than the others. I think, of course, Marx talked about that in his Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. Right? When he talked about one sensuous being, that's how Marx would put it. But it's a recognition that we're more than simply the material, etc. And he's concerned about the soul. And the soul really goes to that other dimension of the self, which, of course, is non-material. We, of course, we really live in terms of our consciousness and in our conscience. In the souls of white folk, he addressed the international struggle of black people to regain their freedom from the white world. In the aftermath of World War I, where the American government, as you know, fought to do what? Make the world safer democracy. He asks, and this is the question he asks, how many of us today fully realize that the current theory of colonial expansion of the relations of Europe, which is white, to the world, which is black, and brown and yellow? Bundley put, he says, that theory is this, is the duty of white Europe to divide up the darker world and administer it for Europe's good. That's quite an insight. It's the beginning of the understanding that wars are not simply fought for moral concerns and moral reasons. Very few are, anyhow. But there has to be, if war is, wars are really fought, he's going to argue, whatever they mask it in. I mean, you know, weapons of mass destruction, right? Hello? Weapons of mass destruction? Yeah? I don't think we ever got it, did we? But the amount of money we expanded in that theory... <laughs> Because there are always other kinds, I suspect we'd always argue. But he said that World War I was fought in terms of trying to defy the world. But I think the one you'd really think is most important is, and I think everybody here, please, is only about 20 pages. Since you see what you wonder what Wesley, Lee, Lee, Lee? You wonder what Wesley people are teaching and so on. Lee, Wesley, I'm not seeing Lee. Oh, oh, great Lee. It's a very short essay in something called Dark Water. It's the most progressive essay on women you will read at that time. It's called The Damnation of Women. He talks about the central role that women have played in black history and culture, both in Africa or in African societies and the United States. It was one of the most forward-looking essays on women's rights at the time. He reviews the devastating effects that slavery had upon black women and talk about white, what white folks had done to black women. Even the white woman, by the way. I don't know if anybody read Hazel Carby, The Cult of True Womanhood. Anybody read Hazel Carby, The Cult of True Womanhood? Particularly in the South. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And you know why Uncle Tom's Cabin became, became such a, best, a bestseller, right? Why did Uncle Tom's Cabin become such a bestseller? Second only to uh, the Bible. Anybody have any sense? I sh I mean, Harry was some from up here, right? Some place. Uh, Bridget Stowe was from some place up here. And the argument is that Bridget Stowe book, because the women at the time were reading a lot of novels. At the time, women were reading a whole lot. And the contradiction of there is that while men were imposing their values, that a good woman was what? Virtuous. Pious. Chastity. That the men were having a good time out in the fields. So when the women look out of the fields and saw uh, kids looking like their husbands, they say, uh-oh. <laughs> then in fact, all of these vows were imposed by men on women while men were free to play. And what Du Bois says in that essay, in terms of, again, his Stanley takes a very powerful piece, he says, I shall forgive the white South much in its final judgment day. I shall forgive its slavery, for slavery is a world old habit. I shall forgive its fighting for a well lost cause. 
But one thing I shall never forget, neither and never I shall never forgive, neither in this world nor in the next or the world to come. It's wanton and continued and persistent insulting of black womanhood, which is sought and seeks to prostitute to its lust. It's not just about sociology, y'all. It's not just about NACP. It's also about the rights of women. Now, the truth is that both he and Douglas saw a coming together, understood the, 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 dialect, the dialectic way in which the struggle for women's rights and black rights were intertwined. You couldn't have one without the other because you have the same, whatever, I mean, to use the words of women, words of women, the patriarchal, that's what I say, yeah. <laughs> formations. You know, when I, had to, when I got to Wells, I lived to teach a new. My language had to become different. <laughs> but of course, interestingly enough, when this essay, The Damnation of Women, which, I, which uh, Lee assures me and Gigi assures me, everybody would read, it's only about 20 or 30 pages. <laughs> so when I come to launch my book, we should have read Damnation of Women. <laughs> yeah. While this essay was being written, it's 1920. The rights of women to vote was being debated in the U.S. Congress. Congress passed the 19th Amendment to the Constitution on June 4, 1919, and ratified it on August 18, 1920. Amidst the fury of the debate, Du Bois elevated the women's struggle as being of third in importance to all uh, of the struggles that faced uh, black people. Now remember I started by saying that Du Bois' major contribution is that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. He was a race man. Race was important. 1920, the peace movement is also important because you have to have peace. And here's Du Bois speaking in 1920 when he says that the uplift of women, now get this right, that the uplift of women is next to the problem of the color line and the peace movement, our greatest modern cause. The uplift of women is next to the problem of the color line and the peace movement, our greatest modern cause. When now the two of these movements, women and color, combine in one, the combination has deep meaning and deep power. And we saw it. On the backs of all his movement, he also had rise of the women's movement. But he recognized that the two went hand in hand. Because they all, in a way, spoke about the way in which women and blacks and colored folks were kept enchained because of the dominance. I don't want to hit the, the brothers. I don't want to hit the brothers. I want to hit the brothers. But they said we always control the world. And of course, the point is the black men get mad with us too. Because if we took over your habits of control. So you look in 1970, after the black part of the civil rights passage, the, back, the, the civil rights passage of the bills on the liberation of black people, the black women's movement takes off. It's not coincidental that in 1970, the three or four most important books, I know why a caged bird sings. All right? Daddy was a numbers runner. The Bluest Eye by Morrison, they all come out in that year. Because women now are unchained before they stick together with the men because they're a common enemy. But once those laws are passed, Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, women now could begin to act. And anybody read or uh, seen The Color Pibble by Alice Walker? Anybody went to the Spielberg movie? Spielberg did a movie on the color purple. Brothers got mad, walked out of the movie. Talk about this woman stuff, man. I don't want to hear that woman stuff. But she wasn't talking about women. She was talking about, she wasn't talking about men. She was talking about women's bonding, coming together for their own liberation. So it's the question of male and our control and our buying into what it constitutes a man, given the dominant ideal, also became a problem in that situation. I'm coming in, don't worry, I'm not gonna hold you too long. <laughs> Black Reconstruction, though was Du Bois's major work. And I said, for example, that he understood then that the problem was not a moral question. 
it was an economic problem. As he said when I gave that first quote, that then he understood that in fact, sorry, yeah, and of course he understood in that book that the question becomes one of economics and who control it. And of course what he would say, and I'm going to go through very quickly, that the foundation stone not only of the southern and social structure, but of the northern manufacture and commerce of the English factory system of urban commerce, of buying and selling on a wide scale, he cites the cities were built as a result of black labor and a new labor problem involving all white labor rose both in Europe and America. In other words, what, what he argues that the question of the building blocks, the building blocks, the building blocks for European development, of course, and even development here, came off of the exploitation of black labor. Very quickly, I would run through that. But of course, if we go to the last point, I, even that book was so very important that in point of fact, it spurned two very important books, which, is now, which are now the cornerstone of black intellectual thought. C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins, which talks about the Haitian Revolution. And you know the Haitian Revolution. How did we get Louisiana? Anybody knows? How much you paid for it? How, why, why, why you got it so cheap? Why would the French want to sell uh, Louisiana? Haiti whipped the Europeans. <laughs> and of course, Mr. Napoleon was coming here to go on to where? Because most of Louisiana is owned by whom? The French. And when they were whipped in Haiti, they said, let's get rid of this place, man. That's how we got here. Louisiana. I didn't know that, didn't you? We don't, we don't, sometimes we only teach facts. We don't ever talk about causal connection. Yeah. And that's why the Haitian Revolution is the third most important revolution in, of course, ushering the contemporary era. The American Revolution, most important. Why? It put into being the control of the ordinary people. Before you have what? The divine rights of king. You're king because your father's a king. And America said, no, 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 no. Even a dog catcher is going to have to be elected. <laughs> then in 1989, you have what? The French Revolution. And by 1900 or so, 1800, you've got the Haitian Revolution, which does what? Frees all black folk. 1900, Haitian Revolution, even leading to the American Revolution in 1865, Brazilian Revolution of 1888, that was the revolution that set and broke up the whole system of the enslavement of men by men. The three most important revolutions, we don't teach it that way, do we? We, we, don't, we don't do that way at all. Things just happen, you know? The idealist causation. It just happened because somebody got to feel good one day and so on. <laughs> if you're a Marxist, you look at the historical. So the, the, the black reconstruction was very important. All of also comes Eric Williams' capitalism and slavery. And he says an important thing about slavery. What Williams says about slavery, slavery was not born of racism. Rather, racism was the consequence of slavery. Folks in government say one day we're going to just hate black people. Come on. It doesn't happen that way. Now, there are theorists who does, does not accept that position. But the major position here is that, that racism, slavery was not born of racism. Rather, racism was the consequence of slavery. Because it says in the Caribbean and the New World, unfree labor in the New World was brown, white, black, and yellow, Catholic, Protestant, even pagan. Because the only thing about Catholic is, is to exploit what? Is to get slippers, surplus values, as Marx talked about in his uh, capital uh, first book. So the question is, you don't care who buys your stuff, right? If you're a businessman, you don't care who buys it, right? Pink could buy it, white could buy it, woman could buy it, gay. You don't care who buys it, just buy it. I've got to get my turnover and my capital. Last point, and I'll end because I know I've been too long. Suffice it then to say, and I, would, I, I could go into that when I uh, finish, that Du Bois then, I would talk about it probably in the chat, never has gotten his correct place in American history or in American intellectual thought. They could go to school and never hear about Du Bois and what he's done. One of the most important thinkers is Du Bois in terms of the question of race and race theory. Anthony Appiah, who's a philosopher, was at Harvard, is now, I think, at probably NYU, takes the place that no, takes the position nobody talks as much about race as Du Bois and discusses and analyzes race as Du Bois. But given our racial proclivities, we have never even spoke about him. 
And so I shall end on one tiny note. The major book I've sort of been pushing a lot and talking a lot about is this book by Alden Morris, and I'll just give one quote from it. And his point is that Du Bois has never been really uh, accepted and given his place in American intellectual thought. Most importantly, as the father of American social sociological thought, and more importantly, not the Chicago school, but the Atlanta school, which begins with the, uh, the Philadelphia Negro, is really the starting point of American sociology and to some degree American pragmatism, right? Because they were working with their hands. Last point, and I shall end. In terms of trying, Morris simply argues in his book, and I should just simply read that quote, and I will end. He says, well, uh, two more things I have to end on. He says, of course, the most important thing this, the secret has been kept that, of course, Du Bois has been the most important uh, thinker and the father of American sociology. One last point, which I think Gigi alluded to. Sometimes in life, you don't know where fate drives you. And I was saying to her, in 1971, or 70, I taught at Fordham. As a young instructor, I had the pleasure of introducing Shirley Graham Du Bois. Didn't even know who she was. Quite honestly, a young man, a Du Bois, who is she? And it turned out to be interesting enough. But more importantly, about four years later, 64, I, in, I got to this country in 64 and 68, I began to write for Freedom Ways. And Freedom Ways was started by Esther Jackson, Shirley Graham Du Bois, and who? W. Du Bois. And there I was, as a young man, writing for these people, working with Esther Jackson, out of not New York, and not knowing that to some degree I was part of that much larger heritage of black intellectual thought. And so therefore I feel especially privileged to talk with you about some of my insights about Du Bois. I hope I have convinced you that really he needs to be looked at a second time or perhaps a third time because at the center of American intellectual thought, there stands Du Bois grappling with that one problem which is still bringing us to the ground the question of race, which we have to work out and try to work through. But Du Bois was the pioneer study, and looking at him helps us to understand that question a little more. Thank you so very much. I spoke too much, right? Too well. Yeah, that's okay. You had a lot of wonderful things to say. I guess we can have like two questions, and then we'll just have snacks and Good chat evening. informally. You're burning, Shirley. Do you have a question? No, I'm stretching. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, here's Sorry, yes. I have a question. Oh, it's not central to your talk, which is fascinating. I'm not familiar with the uh, theology of the AME Church. Is this a church that, what's the view of God? Is God acting through the world, or is he sitting above and judging? Well, the fundamental difference between black religion and white religion is that God gave whoever it is the word, and he kept the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and they kept it someplace else. In black religion, God is a, a, comes out and dwell among us. And we feel the power, and we get good, and we feel happy because God is amongst us. Now, the problem is that as much God is a much more active presence in our lives, almost like art too. It's not something just to be admired. Art is an active part. Part of the philosophical dimensions of African thought is a kind of much more grappling with things rather than kind of speculating and all that kind of good stuff. So I think in terms of the ME church, of course, you know why it got started, because the blacks couldn't uh, worship with the other whites, so they started their own church. But of course, but God is much more real, because remember, for a slave, he had no other, his only hope when things got bad is that when he dies, he will join Jesus in his heavens and all shall be equal. When I talk about liberation theology uh, in Latin America, that's the notion of liberation theology that Christ could be a revolutionary, he's not somebody who just sits piously by. And so therefore for black folk, the only hope is that when they die, there will be equality. So there was a greater belief in God as a personal liberator than someone who just you go and you pray and you, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think that's one of our, yes, I think it's inherent in Afro-American theological 
uh, in a philosophical system. Thank you. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm actually not familiar with Shirley Du Bois, and I wondered if there was a collection of her writings outside of Freedom Ways. No, Shirley Du Bois taught here. She, at UMass? Yes, yeah, she was teaching here. Ah. When it would have no place else, go speak to John Bracey. Okay. She was, that's why you got the papers. Oh. Not that well, you're so lovely and wonderful. But she, you accepted her, and she came here, and she worked here. And her work, uh, you could go and look up her works. Go and look up the children. In fact, one of her, niece, one of her distant cousins was in my class. <laughs> yeah, but the work is here, you gotta, of course, she was much younger than he was. He was about 40 or 50 years younger, older than he was. I know many of you all are not going to marry somebody so much <laughs> older than you all, but she wanted to be Israeli's helpmate, mm. and uh, they worked very well together. She's the one who spread his gospel and worked with him afterwards, so that she's a very, it almost reminds me of Winnie Mandela mm -hmm. and Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I, went, I went to, um, I went to Sweden, and I went to where Nelson and Win Winnie uh, sort of lived. And you know, one reason why they broke up after he came to prison is that she had a younger man. And I didn't mind that. Brother's been in prison for 27 years. You don't expect any man to wait. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you don't expect no sister to wait for you, right? You understand a sister have, uh, you know, needs companionship. But what got him very angry, that even after he came out of prison, she kept on with his relationship. And that was sort of... But I go to the house, this is my point. I want to win Mandela's sort of she had her own group, you know, that whole whatever, whatever follows. So I'm kidding her and says, man, what's wrong with you, man? Why are you messing with my man? Why would you mess with my man? She looked at me and smiled. I said, come on, man, what happened? Why should another man? She looked at me. She's about 70, 80. She said, let me tell you something. My husband died 10 years ago. If he comes back, I don't want him anymore. <laughs> I said, well, why not? She said, the freedom I have now. <laughs> with him, I couldn't have that freedom. So she's a new state of new place and so on. And so therefore the sense of freedom and liberation comes without having that oppressive sort of presence in one life. But in terms of Graham Du Bois and uh, Shirley Graham and Du Bois, they were, she was really helping because she had married, had her own kids, but she really wanted to work with him because she saw the great work that he was doing. But she said, somebody should do some work with. And you could look at the magazine, but she has her own things you could look at. I don't know if, I'm not sure if there's a biography now, but I can find out. I think we should at this point once again invite Professor Keith Wells.